to process but anyway but i mean let me know you know i'm happy to answer any questions you have really about i'll try my best and uh, see okay. how we, i don't know what style you go for but you you, okay. you lead the way so to me you All lead right. it's your thing <laughs> okay well uh you know we so uh usually what i do uh, is, is recording now um is say you know welcome to um uh, my youtube channel archaeo viking um uh, for those of you who are watching, this is Dr. Howard Williams, uh, our tonight's uh, guest, who is a uh, specialist in uh, early medieval archaeology, uh, as well as, I believe, a couple of other things. Um, and I have him here uh, one to, for a couple of reasons. One, to talk about his work, and then uh, later on, we're going to talk about uh, both the accuracy of, uh, of early medieval uh, things in movies, TV shows, and video games, but also um, how much we should criticize them yeah. versus how much we should accept them. So, uh, with that, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Howard? Uh, oh yeah, how, how, thank you for inviting me. And uh, yeah, you're I'm, very I'm I'm, 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 yeah, so I'm, I'm a professor of archaeology at the University of Chester, where I've been for the last thirteen and a bit years. And before that, I've been teaching and researching at uh, three other academic institutions. So I've been around for a while doing my archaeology thing, doing some field work, doing you know, library based and, uh, uh, you know, archive based work and uh, generally exploring things on, you know, Anglo-Saxon England, Viking Age Scandinavia um, and early medieval Wales, but also doing some more history of archaeology, public archaeology and sort of contemporary archaeology, looking at 20th, 21st century stuff as yeah. well. But but mainly, I you know, my heart is in the early Middle Ages uh, of Northwest Europe, and that's what I focus on, really. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Yes, and I, I believe uh, some of your recent work has been published in uh, the journal Office Dyke, I believe. Uh, why yes. Why about some of that? OK, right. Yeah. So what I did was um, we have lots of regional, national journals, international journals, but we don't have really um, we, we didn't really have a, a journal, academic journal dedicated to frontiers and borderland regions focusing on linear monuments. And I became really interested when I moved to this region sort of 13, 14 years ago in uh, the Great Britain's first and second longest early medieval linear earthworks uh, first and third of any date because hadrian's wall is longer than the third longest but these are offers dyke and watts dyke and i actually live right next to both of these monuments and they are phenomenal earthworks obviously damaged and you know much questions around them but i became part of a research network which i co-founded called the offers dyke collaboratory to bring together scholars because um, these these linear earthworks kind of sit literally they were frontier works but they also sit between people's research folky and one of the things we did was to uh, generate a new design and establish a new academic peer-reviewed open access journal called the office night journal so i've been co-editing that with my doctoral researcher liam delaney and we've just uh, published volume three so we've got one one for 2019 two for 2023 for 2021 and we're working on volume four for 2022 if i've got that right yeah mm -hmm. and then we're going to do at least a number five and then see where we go from there but the idea is we have so to gather together researchers who may be publishing in very disparate places to tackle frontiers and borderland monuments. And uh, we, while our focus is on early medieval, we also getting we want comparative materials from across the globe, from different periods and places so that uh, it's a bit outside my usual death interest. But there are multiple ways in which the mortuary angle is coming in. Um, but 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 it's a, these are really enigmatic monuments. Given their size, you'd think we'd know more about them. But there's still so many unanswered questions about when they were made, why they were made, how they how long they lasted, how they were built, you know, how they how they were refortified at different times. You know, this is this is and it's an issue across early medieval Europe, West Asia, uh, and and also, frankly, um, you know, it, it's it's a global phenomenon in terms of borders, walls frontiers do they work have they ever worked have they ever worked as they intended to work you know and, and these questions have a deep time significance that archaeologists can contribute to they're not just issues for you know the 20th 21st century so that's why i sort of established a journal we called it rather myopically the offers dyke journal because we knew that would be our primary focus but frankly we're getting papers on all sorts of stuff and i've got a just to make it a bit pertinent we've even got i've even commissioned a paper on some ukrainian linear earthworks from the first first wow. millennium maybe so um you know which have again like many of these earthworks we don't exactly know which dynasties which polities 
established them and for what reasons other than the generic to keep out nomads you know which is every, every earthwork is to keep out barbarians or keep out nomads but actually we with closer scrutiny we realize as with roman frontiers it's a lot more complicated than that yeah, yeah and, and same with uh, chinese frontiers uh, absolutely cause, yeah because uh, i know a little bit about this personally but actually the uh, great wall of china uh, was actually when it was it's talked about it was first built by the first emperor of China but actually uh, the document's talking about his when he sent his uh, top general general Ming to the frontier what he actually did is he built a series of, of forts to attack not defend so they were forts yeah. to where he could have soldiers garrisoned and if they needed to launch punitive raids like say Rome did to Scotland or Germania then they could because exactly. that's another thing because that's another thing actually you know um one of your videos talked about you know scotland in particular but the same goes for germania the whole the whole myth of oh rome could have never conquered these regions well actually they got pretty close and actually you yeah. know there was the antonine wall which is a prime example and then there was also before then there was germanicus's invasion into germania exactly, um, both of exactly. which were highly successful but the prices were expensive and oftentimes it, it was political in fact the antonine wall was um uh, stopped because Commodus, you know, decided, well, I'm not going to pay for this anymore. This yeah. is my father's and my grandfather's vanity project. So I'm just going to go yeah. back to the Hadrian Wall. So there's so much uh, we overemphasize the military. I'm not saying the military factors aren't important, but we try to simplify to the military. And we always, even when we talking about the military rationales for these earthworks, to assume there was a single consensus. Yeah, it, 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 we we would you know it's like trying to talk about consensus about border uh, policies today in a de yeah. democratic world or even in a in a despotic regime. You can't get a consensus even in a even when you have one agent, one sort of you know yeah. charismatic leader. Let alone when you're dealing with uh, complex dynasties, successive rulers with different agendas, different priorities, different threats. So yeah, we we we're a bit naive in our popular understanding. Everyone wants to impose yeah. a simple story onto these yeah. monuments and often we can and some sometimes we can but often we can't and uh, and yeah so it's it's really interesting um and it links to modern geopolitics so whether it's on a local or sort of intra national level like wales and england's identity you know so that's one of the things that's really interesting in the last couple of years is how much offers dyke has been in the social media discourse as a rhetorical shorthand for the English Welsh border, even though very little of Offa's Dyke actually is conterminous with the modern English Welsh border. Yes, it mm. runs broadly up following yeah. each other in different ways, but 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 this is a shorthand. It's long been there. The Welsh use it. Sports if a sports commentator talks about a Welsh team playing an English team, they say, well, they came across Offa's Dyke. It's in, it's, an, it's it's long been used as a shorthand. But in the last two years with the pandemic, that border you know the different uh, different medical situations, different lockdown regimes has caused all manner of tensions. And in jest, of course, in jest, but people are talking about things like refortifying Offa's Dyke against the Welsh, or refortifying. Then the next month, a different set of regime, the uh, uh, pandemic lockdown restrictions come in, and then the the Welsh are going about let's let's reverse Offa's Dyke and uh, refortify it against the English. And you know anyone that comes from the borderland territories get gets very frustrated because it doesn't make sense geographically but if you're in london and if you're in cardiff the equivalent to being if you're in san diego or um uh you know new york or something like yeah. that then you know it makes sense to talk about the middle of the us in such crude and insulting terms because you don't you're not actually there in the same way as if you're in cardiff and you're in london you can talk about the anglo-welsh borderlands and just say offers dyke because you know it's somewhere in that space but you know for anyone living in the actual areas it just it's so annoying and so you know divisive you know so yeah borderlands and border monuments are really interesting and they they are some of them are very ancient but they have stories that touch us today and they 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 they're like sleeping dragons that sort of resurface and can sort of cause problems when you least expect them <laughs> and uh, that's we've seen that in, with offers dyke in the last couple of years with all manner of should we say even if said in jest and even if said the rhetorical use of them in modern politics has been quite shocking um so yeah it's it's an interesting archaeology always touches on modern politics you can't avoid it no you can't um <laughs> Yeah, uh, and and uh, now I believe and again that you I believe you've touched on this in your uh, videos before, but um, I believe Offa's Dyke is just an ironic name. Offa probably didn't actually build it himself. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. 
I mean, yeah. this is a this is a uh, well, it depends on. It's very difficult to simplify, but we don't. We have now emerging dates that do confirm a late eighth century building yeah. phase. But this this monument runs for at least 130 miles. Um, and it may have been planned by the Mercian kingdom of central England against Welsh rivals, but it, it may not have been built exclusively by offer. It yeah. may not have been built as a border. It, it's probably a zone of offensive control. So it's, it's actually yeah. like like Roman frontier works. We understand them now are not there to just hide behind. They're there to literally hegemonically control to their front you know to actually dominate the land beyond um and um yeah and and uh you know there are hints of earlier phases and earlier monuments that may have been incorporated into it but we have so few dates um it's still up in the air really but yeah mm. the offer name is really interesting because we don't exactly know whether the offer name is like a a, a trump wall thing you know it's like I, I'm going to build the biggest dike and it's the greatest ever. Make Mercia great again, you know. You know, so yeah. is it is it is it is it an egotistical? I'm going to name the frontier after me, or is it or was it done by successive generations remembering a historical event? Or and the other game is that maybe it's deliberately playing on the idea of the old oh, the first offer the first who is recorded in various legends as a king of Angel Angel on the continent and recorded as a dike builder. So it may yeah. be. Not so much that Offer built the dike as Offer wanted to. There's a play on the original Offer here, and it's almost yeah. giving it a legendary name. Um, so it's a bit of a weird one, really. Yeah. Um, so it might be like calling it Washington's uh, <laughs> Wall. You know, it's like you know, well, what was George Washington got to do with Mexico in the in the, on the, on the Rio yeah. Grande and that nothing, but that it's like an honorary giving it an old title. Um, um, so we don't know exactly what the Offer's dike name means in relation to who exactly built it but it's, yeah it's it's you'd think we'd know wouldn't you you know such a big monument um yeah but there's still very few conclusive dates for it okay yeah we know it's early medieval we've got radiocarbon dates from it that are post-roman and we know one mm. site where it was long known that it crosses a roman camp station you know roman small station on a, on a roman road so we know it's post-roman um so it's not like bronze age or iron age or you know something like that we we've got it in the early middle ages we know it dates from the you know fifth to uh, you know ninth century but uh we're still trying to work out whether it was a one phase monument and and who built it and why <laughs> yeah well, uh, that's that definitely something to consider. Um, and you know, uh, what? How is there any record, like archaeologically or textual, that talks about how the various Welsh kingdoms and uh, such reacted to the office uh, dike being built? Yeah. Well, this is the fun thing because, of course, uh, a lot of the evidence for where and what the Welsh kingdoms were at the time of the eighth, ninth centuries is often made as a circular argument from where Offa's dyke is. So, a lot <laughs> of historians, a lot of historians, have assumed this was a border, and therefore, like the the kingdom of Powys, which is the great sort of northeastern and mid Wales kingdom, must have been west of that border. Um, but a lot of the polities from the early Middle Ages in Wales are really difficult to pin down. You know, I think we have to think of it very much, very much like early medieval Ireland as a, f a real fragmentary picture of localised rulers and these big kingdoms, um, which obviously by the ninth century, Gwyneth becomes almost like a proto-Welsh kingdom. It takes over and has hegemony over all of the Welsh-speaking territories uh, for a time um, yeah. up until the, um, you know, before that, you may be looking at really districts which have sort of dynasties that come to the fore. So, one, you know, the Kingdom of Powys, which is the Welsh kingdom that probably stood off most of Offa's Dyke, uh, may have been not a coherent polity for more than a century uh, before Offa's, Offa's monument. So it, may, it doesn't go back to some fifth, sixth century Dark Age origins. It may actually be a new conglomeration, a new alliance. So we've got to imagine a very fluid picture, a very fragmentary picture. And what they thought about the dike, well, I think the point, what they would have thought, and this is the, the opening point, is I think they would have thought of themselves as having more a more affinity with the Mercian uh, policies to the, the peoples and policies to the east of the dike. As with the Roman frontiers, they, uh, I think that one of the dike's purpose was to divide, literally divide between people incorporated into a Mercian kingdom and those kept out. And so I think it was as much cutting up um, rather than keeping out people's already established so i think it did in the long term create a sense of ethnic identity it oh, okay. created wales it, you know it created a rhetorically by 
um, it, it created Welshness and, and a, a Welsh shared identity. And it also created the sense of an old north, the idea there was an area of Wales lost, not only the lands to the east, but the areas to the north, the old north, um, the, where where there were Cumbric speaking peoples, you know, in um, surviving right the way through the early Middle Ages. But people had a consciousness that they were literally beyond the Germanic speaking, the Anglo, the Saxon yeah. speakers. So I think um, there's I think over the long term, may not maybe not by design. I'm not saying within a sense of years, but I think in sense of centuries, Offa's Dyke, in, you know, perhaps inadvertently, inadvertently created Wales and a sense of Welsh identity oh, and okay. Celticism as, as, as a spin off from that, as a sense of there are places elsewhere where people have a share. We have a shared affinity with. So Offa's Dyke caused a lot of trouble and actually created a modern sense of Wales in <laughs> in a sense <laughs> more than anything else um, that the the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that's uh, that's uh, that's very interesting. Um, so uh, tell us about uh, some of your other work that you've done yeah. uh, recently. Well, I've I've been I've been I've been continuing to do my long running work on mortuary archaeology, and mm -hmm. I've been doing work on some medieval um, and early uh, early medieval um, um, mortuary an analysis and uh, you know uh, cemetery analyses. And so I've got I had a paper out in 2018 reevaluating early Anglo-Saxon 5th, 6th century um, mortuary houses, which I did with a US based uh, um, archaeologist. Uh, we did a paper together in the Archaeological Journal. And we basically suggested that the usual picture for the 5th, 6th century is that people in eastern and southern England were either cremating the dead or inhuming the dead. And we suggested there was a third pathway that people haven't fully recognized um is that you cremated the dead but then you kept the remains above the ground in mortuary houses something which has oh. been discussed a little bit but we've we pulled together the evidence of all the post hole structures that that create it, that we think are have been previously interpreted as pyres you know where you may have burnt the dead or else thought of as just like little monuments to commemorate where you buried the dead underground but we're suggesting they were like columbaria like little houses where you stored pots containing the ashes of families oh, okay. ab above ground and so we're trying to say that that may have been more common than people have previously thought of so that's one piece of recent you know early medieval burial research i i've been doing uh you know and um what else have i been up to well i suppose i've been also working a lot on public archaeology and producing these kind of edited volumes with my students uh, from conferences that the students organise as part of their degree programme. So that's been quite different, uh, um, working on different themes in public archaeology, one of which was frontiers and borderlands, but another one was on death and uh, another one was on uh, art and archaeology engagements and a further one on the Dark Ages or the early Middle Ages and popular, how do we combat combat popular perceptions preconceived ideas of of the dark ages so that's been a taken up a lot of my time but it's been really fun working with students you know okay. getting stu getting students to publish some of their work uh but also getting leading experts to co publish in the same venue and some people have been a bit snobby about that and a bit uh it's had some critical comments for being a bit too radical but um i think it's actually quite a healthy thing and i think we should see more of that in coming years and but i've done yeah i'm on my fifth volume and the the current volume i'm working on is called the public archaeology of treasure and uh -huh. yeah moving beyond just looking at the illicit trade and antiquities and you know plundering sites metal, the controversies about metal detecting we're also looking at things like how treasure is represented in video games in tv in yeah. in heritage sites you know i mean we have some of our major heritage sites use that as a tag you know and it links into this issue of how much do we indulge these these terms which can be very pernicious and can be yeah. very damaging yeah. but also they capture the imagination and make people think so yeah we're, we're, i'm pulling that volume together right now that's one of the things i'm up to and that's taken a lot of work um and i'm trying to write the introduction which is really because given the global parameters of treasure from s shipwrecks to um looting in uh you know iraq or you know where yeah. syria or you know anywhere like that you know, it's really difficult to pitch this right without you know, getting it saying the wrong thing, shall we say? Yes. <laughs> so it's a bit of a, a sensitive topic, but I think an important one because of all the books and studies that have been of, you know, like uh, by archaeology, um, looting. There's never been a book sort of looking at it in a broader pop culture sense as well, and thinking about how you know we we sort of rub shoulders whether we like it or not with some very you know you know very you know, very 
should we say non-academic ideas about what treasure is and what tre- yeah. what archaeologists do you know from indiana jones and lara croft to yeah know, uh, yeah to um the uh, uncharted games uh yeah 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 there's so many dimensions to it and i think we're not going to do this topic justice but we're as a first book on trying to do it i think it's gonna hopefully be of interest to people and people think well they don't talk about this there's more work to be done there they don't talk about that there's more work to be done there but that's yeah. all good you know but i think it's it's i'm just trying to get this volume together and out this year because a book on the public archaeology treasure which is going to be open access i think will be yeah. of interest to a lot of people i think and um yeah so that's another thing i've been doing and my, i've got a chapter in it myself of course and that's going to be on the um how we perceive that uh, that one of Britain's greatest treasures, which should, uh, and I'm taking a hard line on this one, while I'm quite indulgent of pop culture ideas in other contexts with, with the paper I'm writing about the Sutton Hoo treasure, uh, the, uh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm actually basically ripping uh, um, the, the, uh, the discipline a new um, back passage in suggesting that we have indulged for over 70 plus years, however long it's since been since 1939, um, uh, 80 years or whatever. I, I don't even know anymore. I can't even work out where, what year I'm in. Never mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. like 90 years. You know, we, we're you know, we indulged this idea of treasure, that it's a treasure. And, uh, you know, why it was never even declared legally a treasure. This term, this epithet has really dragged on and it's been in the British Museum. You can go and see the Sutton Hoo treasure. You can go to the National Trust site at Sutton Hoo where they talk about it as treasure. They quote Beowulf, the Anglo-Saxon poem, and talk about the the references to treasure in there and so my paper is really just taking everyone to task for using this term yeah. the Sutton Hoo treasure because I think it is deeply but yeah. it's wrong it's just yeah, it's, it's, it's wrong yeah. ethically and it's wrong in terms of accuracy but also it has um it, it yeah it, it's really not 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 even you know respectful of the funerary context it's a barrier yeah. you know you wouldn't you wouldn't go around and call it uh, you mm-hmm. know an indigenous indigenous burial ground a, a treasure hoard yeah. uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't call a roman cemetery uh, you know uh, a treasure you know if you found a few grave yeah. goods with a exactly. roman so, so why the heck are we doing it just because it's yeah it's more golden garnet than you can than we used to but it's still it's still someone's selected objects that are placed with yeah. that dead personal persons um and uh you know why are we why are we talking about it in those terms um so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, uh, that should knock off a few archaeologists and that's all right that's my job isn't it to annoy people as well as to educate and engage so um but we've got to get some of these topics are so are quite sensitive but you, i think we do need to tackle them yeah <laughs> so that, i agree so that's some of the things i'm up to really so still sticking with the early medieval but doing a bit of public archaeology and uh doing this linear frontier you know earthwork work research as well mm-hmm. well uh, yes i think that's very interesting i think that's very uh good work to do i mean um you know uh, i've been in the u.s with the existence of uh laws like nagpra which frankly need to be strengthened um, yeah, yeah i don't know if you know what nagpra is it's yes the... of course yes okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't have I mean, an intimate detail of all its dimensions, but no, I'm, I'm no, aware neither do I. But the, the discussion, but, I do know, yeah. but it's, it's it's a very important law that needs yeah. to um, actually be strengthened uh, quite a bit, because um, uh, and actually I have a um, one of my mentor uh, who is an archaeologist. He's currently trying to work to build a bigger museum for a Mississippian site, and he's uh, one of his parameters because we I was sitting in. Um, his presentation about it and he said one of the key things that we can never discard in this is that the uh because the mississippians uh were the ancestors of various tribes including the muskogee tribe or the creek indians and he's like we need them to be part of the decision making at literally every step he's like yeah. we're not we're not going to be like call them occasionally in fact he's trying to uh the board to make for the museum he's like i want uh a member or several members of the tribe to be part of that uh board so that everyone is there making the decision together because they are willing to work with us so yeah so i think that's very good because like i said office burial i mean sorry not office burial something who which may or may not be office burial uh is somebody's burial so yeah. and you have to respect that so yeah. and i think we ha- yeah it's it's true of well, there's there's so many dimensions to it in the UK, and we do have a different culture and attitude towards it. But it's not one of, I think, uh, I have it thrown at me by certain North Americans that we have no care or attention to funerary remains at all. Which is a little, we have a very different tradition and relationship with 
um, there, um, you know, there is no comparable. While there's various claims of indige indigeneity within these islands, um, the British Isles I refer to, um, there's nothing comparable to the col the post-colonial situation you're in. And I, yeah. I, I, while I am sympathetic with some groups in the British Isles who have those assertions, very much they are at best shallow emulations of these deep trauma yeah. and you know yeah. uh you know situations in the colonial context and i i really without putting too fine a point on it i think uh nothing you know there's no there's no comparable situation but then again i also say that of course britain is hardly um hardly detached from that process i mean we're kind of we we caused it all in the first place so i mean it's, so it is a yeah. it is a people are aware of the our museum collections both international and and home collections are are part of this conversation and uh, increasingly that is becoming you know, ratcheting up, you know, that museums, you know, it's not a new idea, but it's 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 really ratcheting up as an important part of what we do with how we treat the dead, how we talk about the dead, how we, you know, the, the future of these collections that we have. So um, it's a different world. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for every country in Europe has a yeah. different different. It's a patchwork of different cultural, religious, social, political yeah. dimensions. But I mean, Britain doesn't pretend it's immune is the point. And we have British bioarchaeologists, you, you know, mortuary archaeologists have long tried to do their bits within the broader context, particularly the museums that have collections, you know, basically plundered from various or acquired, yeah. acquired from various parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, and um, bef before we move on to uh, the uh, the Vikings TV subject. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh somebody i know uh had a uh, requested a question uh well, oh yes a couple of questions for one um well actually one i'll i'll move say for the uh vikings t tv section because it's pertinent to that okay. <laughs> but um but the other one is like you know uh we know obviously you know that there's uh you can tell to some degree social status and uh burial goods and such um but you know uh like so what to what degree in the early middle ages do you see the social status like what sort of markers uh you know like say anglo-saxon or otherwise yeah. do you see other than swords of course because you know yeah. there's always that well what if they you know in battle what if he just happened to get a hold of said sword i mean there's arguments Absolutely. like that with uh the um uh the birka uh yeah, weapon, yeah. right which yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a little more uh, obviously you're an expert. I'm not. I'll I'll still defer to you, but I'm I'm a little more lenient towards that due to the type of um, outfit she's wearing, which is step in indicative and uh, step exactly. warfare tends to be a little bit different. But yeah. regardless, there's still that possibility of like, well, did they get these items in their graves uh, a different yeah. way? You know. So yeah, no, no. This is this is the inter well. I mean, to answer that question, I mean it really depends on which century which region you're talking about and what we find in the early middle ages is that the the, the burial treatment is rapidly changing half century quarter century by century and region by region so that what makes a high status marker in one century may not be very high status in another yeah and then and we do while obviously there's a whole massive story we could make about the extent to which people were moving around people were sharing ideas and moving around so your 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 birka bj581 mm -hmm. uh, you know there's 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 very little doubt that this was a person whose grave was heavily received high status treatment mm. uh, whatever their particular social role and biography as an yeah. individual was that was an individual who had a lot of burial investment but you could make the argument that in a high status emporium with trading connections with central asia um, Eastern mm. Europe and um, also with Anglo-Saxon England and, and parts of the West as well. But Birka, you know, anyone buried in a cemetery there could hypothetically, you know, why are we ca even talking about them as Viking? There's no there's no single society, even with that one settlement. Yeah. Um, and, and the Birka in the late 9th century is going to be very different from the late 10th and the early 11th, you know, so or the, when it's really going out, literally going out at the end of the 10th. So my point is, um, how we read that social status and that identity that individual is often really difficult and like all bear archaeology has been working yeah. on this for 40 50 years you know it's very difficult to pin down for an individual grave but we work with samples we work with broader samples so going back to anglo-saxon england we would you could say quite clearly that 
in the later sixth century, you can see some status markers in high status burials, whether the status is of is of that individual or of their kin group, that that person is invested with a lot of burial wealth, including um, both artifacts, um, numbers and quality, but also scale and character of the grave and external marker, so burial mound and so on. And so we have these really, the, the pinnacle is the late sixth, early seventh century princely burials, mainly male, but some female gendered, which are, you know, are the pinnacle. Um, but the question is, of course, does that mean that there were no high status people in the late seventh and early eighth century? No, they're changing where and how they express their status. And particularly the move to church burial will mean that there's a whole new configuration. So my point is, um, it's not so much identifying high status burials as knowing just because we don't have them in particular regions and places doesn't mean there was no one of status. You know, like if, if we were going to believe, if you want to read off the burial record as literal, literal, that no one in Ireland ever wielded a weapon in the <laughs> early Middle Ages or in Western Britain, you know, we have no weapon burials from early medieval Wales. And, and it's just, so does that mean they're all just peaceful farmers living on the coast in you know, some kind of halcyon world while those, you know, Saxons further east were, were just, you know, or had all the weapons? No, of course not. It's just that they didn't have the tradition of burying the dead with weapons. Yeah. So we don't see it. So it's, it's just, we've. My, I suppose my point is for every region and, and even down to in a local locality, we've got to read the evidence in context. And so there's never going to be a static set of signals for what makes a high status or middling status or low status person. And as I said before, we have both two rights in 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 various degrees of operation. So people are cremating the dead and inhuming, and we very find very few weapons in cremation burials. But we also have evidence they're sacrificing horses whole and you know on the pyre, meaning that the investment and state you know wealth involved in the funeral was at least the same if not more so it's it's we're not comparing it's comparing apples and oranges you can't you can't necessarily read off the same level yeah. of wealth when you have different disposal methods so that's and, and you'd be amazed the number of times that was what my doctoral thesis was about you'd be amazed the number of times that people just come up with the most nonsensical arguments because they forget they they know it they go oh yeah cremation's different but they still say ah oh, but they didn't have many grave goods so they're probably low status and you go but you just, you know, and you reading the papers going. Hmm. So, yeah, uh, there's different disposal methods at play. And then when the church gets involved, uh, particularly from the late seventh century and into the eighth century, then, of course, internal grave goods go out of the game and you're looking at location for burial. So and particularly, you know, you know association with church sites are very difficult to find. But I think are increasingly going to be where the elite are buried. So, yeah. Um, not an easy answer, and that was a really short attempt. But, no, and that and that's fine. And and really, you know, their their question was more in like uh, line with I, I rearranged it a little bit, um, but it was more in line with uh, the um, lay of rig. You know, the the story in the poetic edda where Heimdall yeah. goes and seduces the wives of the various different social statuses. And I yes. could answer his question to a certain degree, but I thought, well, it'd still be a good question to ask about the degree yeah. and the. And the thing, because obviously my answer, he's like, his question was like, well, when did social status arise? I'm like, well, yeah. it arose basically since the New Europeans came here. But if you want to look yeah. at when the Norse uh, and such, you know, started developing it, the Middle Age would be really where you want would want to start. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes, I mean we see a, a massive increase in hierarchies in yeah. the seventh, eighth centuries across Northern Europe. Yeah, uh, exactly. I'm not saying there weren't any any social differentiation in the fifth, sixth century. Of course there were, but I mean it's just that we see it increasingly played out in burial contexts. Yeah, yeah. And this is yeah. where you, yeah, this is where you suddenly get stories about Beowulf and uh, Rolf yeah. Kroki. Um, who may or may not be the same person, especially oh, yes. if, if especially if you take Gregory Gregory of Tours uh accounts of the Danes raiding France in the five hundreds into account. Uh yes, so yes. They mention a king of both the Danes and the Geats raiding the coast of France over and over again. So yes. Yeah. So uh all right, so on to uh, the other topic. Vikings in T V shows, movies, and video games. Oh yeah. Which are obviously more often than not very uh historically inaccurate yeah yeah um for one thing uh, one of my favorite things that i like to bring up to people that not a lot of people know uh is the continued and frankly something i think that should go away sort of uh idea that uh lindisfarne was the first norse raid on england because if you actually read the anglo-saxon chronicle uh it mentions that seven years earlier uh they tried to do it to off his kingdom and off a promptly slaughtered the the pirates who <laughs> landed 
it, it's just one sentence. They tried to raid and our soldiers defeated them. But, um, you know, they don't portray that. And then, of course, things like uh, like the, the 15th century helmets in uh, the Vikings TV show uh, from Italy, of all places, is where they actually come from and, and such. So uh, why don't you tell us about the, you know, one of the various accuracies. And Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, Vikings are everywhere and they're a blessing and a curse and they're a massive yeah. curse. And I would never downplay how much of a nightmare Vikings are, because if you want to study the early Middle Ages, I'd be delighted not to speak about Vikings ever again. And I can do that. There's no reason why I should. I, I, I have to utter the word the place the peoples because my research can but it's what people latch on to it's what people have heard of and it's everywhere so i mean i i and some of my colleagues ha, would will say I, I won't watch the tv shows i won't play the video games i won't even i won't even engage with it because it will ruin my viking age and i think well if your Viking age is so fragile that it depends on TV to get it right, I, come on, you know. Anyway, but that aside, most of us have to, you know, accept that we have to tackle these popular representations. And the question is, where and how do we pitch our battles? When do we? It's not a question yeah. of do we indulge them or not. Um, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to be seen to be someone who says it's okay, it's just entertainment. I've never said that. What yeah. I have tried to argue is that we have to pick our battles and think of the context in which we make our cases because we sadly are in a in a world where we there may be historical advisors involved in these shows and i know and there's an interesting paper by professor neil price about this his role in this which came out in a very expensive book from two years ago but it's actually about his role in advising the tv show vikings so he's yeah. admitted culpability. He's it's just, it's all it's all Neil's fault. In other words, I'm, I'm well. teasing. It's not. It's not. <laughs> but but you know. But he, even with even if you have my you know, say in the best case scenario, even if you have an archaeologist advising, yeah, the kind of things they'll advise you they'll listen to, yeah, you know, will be perhaps very limited. Like I know that Valhalla had um, at least I think it was Jackson Crawford they had and Doctor Rory R- um um. Roderick Dale is involved in Assassin's Creed Valhalla in another capacity. So yeah. they have experts, they've consulted experts in the video game. But the problem is, at what stage, in what regards, and the anecdote I always share with people, and I think I've done, I've mentioned this, is a, a, another colleague of mine, Stephen Harrison, said that he had to stand in for another colleague on set for a day in Ireland for the filming of, I think, season two of Vikings. Uh-huh. And he was there for the whole day drinking coffee and being bored while various lines of Saxons and Vikings lined up and for and the only time anyone turned to him was the sort of deputy director or whatever stood to him and said, How scared will the Saxon pe- peasants be at this particular moment? And he went, you know, really scared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it was like, yeah. What are you supposed to say? You know, it's, it's and I, it's, yeah. All my point is is that I, I'm not saying it's not important. It's really important we get things right, but it's really difficult to know. And I feel very powerless in this regard about where where can we make a difference? And so it's almost like when do you like the people who would say the purists will say we should never even talk to TV companies. We should never even indulge with them. They'll get it wrong anyway. They'll get it wrong if I'm involved and then my name will be on it. And I understand that. And I've, I've been in that position and I have turned shit down. I've done. No, no, I'm not doing this. But then equally, you get to a point where you think, well, maybe I can salvage something if I'm maybe. involved, you know. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I haven't had direct experience here. I can only defer to the experience of others. It's just that I feel there are, even if we can't control it, we can at least use it t- t- to teach. Yeah. Not to, you know, so it's not necessarily about did they get it right, but can we use it? to teach about what they get right and what they get wrong, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's my stance. I'm not, I'm not, an, I'm not a defender. I have been called a friend of some particular productions because I've refused to join the chorus of hate. I, I've, I've said, you know, actually, I think there's some good things here. What people, my academic colleagues have been on social media going, how dare you, you are an appeaser. Yeah. You are a you're defender of the show. And I get, well, no, I'm not, Yeah. you know, and, and unfortunately, uh, it, I was very slightly part of that on TikTok, though mine was much more respectful. I got what, where you were coming from for the most part, but I had a, a different take, and I'm still no, that's sorry. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, but yeah, but I know so why people get so animated and yeah. frustrated with it. I, I'm with you. You know, I I, yeah. I totally understand why people get yeah. so absolutely enraged. I mean, so yeah, no, I I I'm a, what I'm trying to say is I keep flipping 
one way and another depending on the moment and i look at the last kingdom and i go what are they wearing and why why how how did they not see the other army approach what's going on there did they not have lookouts or you know whatever it may be what are they doing with the boats now what what's that about yeah. you know or you know i'm in i'm with you i do that yeah. i but then but then equally i think well what it's out there what can i say that's positive what stories can we you know extract that, that are positive and if I can just quickly say about the one thing I think is really interesting about TV show Vikings, for example, and I have published on, is the funerals. And I think none of the funerals are right in any mm. regard. And you could say, oh, well, we don't know everything, Howard. There's always stuff we don't know. And oh, yeah. even if you're if you say even if you believe all the sagas are history somehow and that they actually happened, right. all the things in the sagas happened, you know, even if you're that naive, they still don't try to reconstruct anything in particular from any particular hero or princess or queen's burial yeah. but what they are doing is giving us a range of of, of options from the viking age a range yeah. of funerals and in that regard i think it's interesting and we can use that because up until a decade ago we had perhaps a handful of representations on in, in film and tv of viking funerals now we've got i don't know how many about 40 yeah. now from different tv shows yeah, before then, one of the most well-known was that Kirk Douglas movie yeah. from like the '60s, where yeah, 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 1958, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and it's and it was it was trashed then, but it's also really good then in the sense that it 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 it, it captured the imagination and but you know and Vikings hasn't tried to make all the funerals like that they've made all the funerals different and with lagatha's funeral they obviously it was a homage to kirk douglas it was a homage to einar his, yeah. the, the, uh, his character it was clearly an overt attempt to we've got to make a homage to it but make it better and even more ridiculous and we've yeah. got massive we've we never used ballistas because the vikings didn't have them we haven't used them in the entire we've attacked paris and we never used them but for lagatha's funeral we've suddenly found these huge ballistas <laughs> and we're going to line them up on the fjord side and fire them at ice because ice breaks in that way apparently you know and it's just like what you know you can almost see the people sort of sitting around really drunk going what do we do for luggers you know it's all ice and we have yeah the priests are like killing horses and then you can almost see them in a drunken conversation just going well what can we really do to annoy the archaeologists um yeah have these huge bolts fire you know and, and it's funny yeah. and hilarious and ridiculous, but actually, you watch that funeral; it takes up a whole episode, and it's wonderful. I love it. I mean, I, I so I'm a complete hypocrite aren't I, to myself because on one level I think it's all rubbish, and another level I'm saying it's so amazing. It's just so amazing to see a whole episode of a TV show dedicated to a funeral. I mean, what Star Wars? If you added up all the funerals in the Star Wars oh, yeah, uh, yeah. universe, it would be what five minutes, three minutes max. Yeah, you know. But the, if you if you added up all the TV, I haven't done this as an exercise. It'd be a good exercise for someone to do. If you added up the number of minutes spent in death rituals in the TV show Vikings, it must be at least two hours of, yeah. <laughs> of, of, yeah. of uh, death. <laughs> well, and unfortunately, because yeah, unfortunately the Vikings are well known for uh, the the flaming boat funerals, which yes, did happen, but not not always. And, and well, and, you know, it depends yeah. who you talk to. <laughs> yeah, it depends on who you talk to, yes. But, you know, and, and one of the things I do, because uh, I didn't play the game, but I have a friend who did play Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and one of the things I like that they did is that they tried to dispose of the... Um, now, it's not quite... I can't say it's a myth yet, because it's hard to prove, but the, you know, they tried to look at it the other side of whether or not Ivar the Boneless was actually a uh, cripple, uh, yeah. Which, which you know, I've heard many arguments uh, that I tend, I tend to so fall on the side of whether or not it was a mistranslation of um, exosis versus exos, you know, terrible versus, uh, you know, or hated versus boneless, you know. But yeah. uh, but that's seen... it's hard to prove. So I've never really looked into this in any detail, so I defer to you on this. But that actually yeah. sounds more convincing to me. Yeah, to me, it's because yeah. because to me, it's like well. You know, it makes no sense for for a general who who in the sagas is described as being this great warrior being carried around on a shield. But a lot of apparent some academics and academic papers I've read have made that argument that uh, exosis, which uh, uh, which means um, uh, hated, can can be very easily mistranslated in, a, into exos, which means boneless. So whether you know, so whoever was writing it down may have. Uh, mistranslated plus there's the enigmatic Imar whether it's Ivar or not but uh, who is in Ireland whose name means Ivar uh, so yeah I do like that I do like that they at least tried to be like okay this is probably not somebody who was 
you know, crippled or, or, you know, disabled of any kind. He was probably just a mistranslation. Or, you know, Bones could have made he was just, you know, a berserker of some sort. We don't know. You know? But I mean, if you want to, you know, if you want to test my limits of my tolerance, the Ivar, the Ivar character in Vikings is isn't a good example, right? So I would, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I, I'm not passionate about which interpretation it is. Let's yeah. say they go with the one he's a cripple, right? So they go yeah. with that, well, they go with that, and they show his struggles, his impotence, his yeah. rage, his psycho. He's a psychopath, you know, yeah. and all of that I loved about him, and I love that character that he's, he's utterly unlovable. And yet yeah, he's you know he's utterly anti here. But then and then I hit my limit, and my limit is when they put him in a boat type helmet thing and stick him in a in a ble- basic bleeding Celtic pre Roman Iron Age chariot. And and then you that that's the point where I just go, where's the drink? You know, what's the point in you know what? Why am I bothering now? You know, because everything up to that was just like, wow, this is really interesting. And then you just go, oh, I get to give up. And then when you have the Rus in paddle boats attacking the coast of Norway, you just go, yeah. You know, they've if there ever they've, was a plot, yeah. they've lost a the plot at this point for me. You know, and so I'm not defending any of that nonsense. Oh, I, I, but 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 you know, I like the. But then my sympathies go to well, it's dealing with the issue of disability, right? This is a big area of archaeological and historical research where disability isn't. And I'm, I'm not saying. The fact they only have one character who's any disability is is a problem, but they have yeah. one character where he's a hero character and he's being given that role. So at least it's fun. It, it, not fun. At least it's there's something to be salvaged there and a conversation to be had about disability in the early Middle Ages and how we imagine it's accommodated in society. And I'm not saying this is the way it was. I'm saying this bring, provokes a conversation yeah. that would otherwise not be there. Because yeah, most exactly. of these TV shows don't show anybody even with a lost finger, let alone a ability yeah. to uh, anything else. So I suppose in that sense, there's something positive. But, yeah. you know, that's really grasping at straws, really. There's so much there that just drives me crazy that I, I, I'm i not yeah. going to defend it at all. Oh, really. no, yeah. I've, I've, I've only was able to watch a couple episodes, so I have no idea what's gone on through the oh. series, you know. Oh. But, but uh, I, then again, I'm also somebody who... Uh, tears apart uh braveheart and oh and other wow that's... movies my uh my wife is is like well why don't you just you know <laughs> enjoy the movie it's it's just a movie and, and see my argument is, is essentially well you know yeah but the thing is there there are people out there who because it's just based on real history or because we had a historian or archaeologist yeah. consult because that like um uh mel gibson's the patriot they had a revolutionary uh era historian they're consulting and the guy who played um the the villain the the cavalry guy who was the villain he he was actually you know he would occasionally ask the uh historian because he didn't know much about the revolutionary war he's like did any of this actually happen and the, the historian's like oh no not at all not even a little <laughs> bit in fact he's like in fact your character was not nowhere near as bad as what <laughs> he's portraying him to be uh and he's like well then why do they have you here and he's like i imagine so they can say that they had a, a historian on set to consult which is essentially what you describe you know <laughs> so, it's like you've got to love and hate actors because the actors obviously believe it and this is the problem is like when i see the with the tv show vikings the clive standen and Catherine yeah. Winnick, who's who seem like really nice people, but they have lost the plot in the sense that they genuinely believe they are show they are depicting historical characters. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Know, and 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 if that you know, and if they're saying that in interviews and Catherine Winnick is going, Yeah, yeah, and I feel I'm embodying how women did things, and you're going, uh, right, okay, or a close, you know, close standing going, Yeah, you know, and Rollo would have done this, and he would and I think I oh, you've really but they have yeah. to do that because they're actors, but they're paid yeah. to do that. They're t- paid yeah. to promote the t- shows, aren't they? Um, yeah. But I think people do perhaps, you know, rest too much emphasis on what um, they course. say. Yeah. But um, so I think there's things to be salvaged from this 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 yeah. debacle, and, and those are positive things. But I would in no way, um, should we say, put a mark of quality or a no. standard. I suppose the only thing, the real constructive question is, what do we need to do? What would we like to see? What would we like to, what, you know, what would we want in the next decade to actually be produced that would be, yeah. would be, would would be hit our basic requirements as as, as researchers? Well, you know, if we were going to make one ourselves, not that I have the talent or ability, but no. you know, if we if we're going to complain about things, what would we do differently? You know, well, I, I don't know. What would be my priorities? You know. Yeah. Well, I I can say one thing. There is a show. Uh, 
out uh, right now. Uh, it's called it's a an anime slash manga called Vinland Saga. Yeah, yeah. And they actually they get of course it's it's still it, it it's it's cheesy, but it's you know yeah. Uh, but it does have a lot of historical accuracy, like um the male and and the like uh, one character has male on and there's gambas and then the helmets are accurate. The axes not so much, but you know yeah. they're people from japan you know sue them yeah. but you know it, but jumps but 30 even, foot in the air and spin yeah. around with knives well, well yeah well they have uh the the individual thorkel the tall who was one of the uh one of the commanders when uh canute uh yes conquered england and they like they have him he swings his axe and he like <laughs> hits he hits uh this this uh mast on a ship and there are people who are like 40 feet away like three different people he hits it the mast explodes yes. and the people's yeah. heads are like decapitated like 30 feet away He's like, uh, and then he they're in the midst of a naval that i forget it was the naval battle um uh oh it was the naval battle between uh uh, uh between knut and uh, olaf tigrinson uh and like he picks up <laughs> he picks up um a body and like lifts it up as a shield <laughs> to, and uses it to, to deflect it and so it's 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 cheesy but they use a lot of historical events and and yeah. everything so it's it's so it's got cool, like it's got an ass called the the uh, the man who is the uh, um, uh, one of the uh, one of the other generals in it. He they depict him assassinating Sven Forkbeard or or something like that. I don't. Remember. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. But it's but but it's much more accurate. So there's definitely a way where you can have the cheesiness of <laughs> a show where it's like, okay, this is obviously fake, but you have actual historical events going on. Uh, but- but you know, almost when it's a anime, you almost yeah. know the the conventions are easier for people to kind of cope with than a live action. Do you think? Yeah. Like you know, it's like the difference between say Mulan and you know that I don't know, I never even saw the new Mulan that I didn't you know either. tank didn't it because it was for many reasons perhaps. You know, but my point well, is, yeah. Know, well, and I do can, know it had some minor degree of historical accuracy because it was um. Because as far as we can tell, Milan uh, originates from during the what was called the Northern Wei Dynasty of uh, China, which was contemporary with the late Roman era and and the early part of the early medieval era. Um, and it was essentially this nomadic tribe called the Zhang Bei came down and uh, con- and colonized and conquered northern China, uh, and they brought some of their tales with them. Because much like um, uh, Scandinavian and Germanic society. Um, Eurasian step societies tend to be more uh, egalitarian and women tend to have more rights. Um, in fact, while the uh, shield made in the Scandinavian culture is up for, is still up for debate, uh, we do know from archaeological records that step uh, the women in step cultures did yeah. in fact fight battles. I mean, this is where yeah. the Amazons come from, the Scythians. So, yeah. you know, that's where that comes from. So they did adopt that, but then they went a whole weird way in the movie. So, uh yeah. But I, I, my, my point would be uh, that, that I think that uh, anime does allow you, you know, it's abstracted, yeah. you know, they're going to be jumping over, yeah. you know, 500 yeah. foot or wherever. And yeah. you'll know that, that there'll be, but also, you know, there's the heroes and the typical guys in the background or gals uh, are not doing those things. And I think that's, you know, so you have, you know, I, I so I kind of, it, I think it's easier to work with. And I think, I, I mean, I've watched. Uh, the I haven't seen the original manga. I haven't. I haven't. But I know you can get a lot of them. But um, but I've seen the anime, and it's really you know it's watchable. I mean, some bits just and Thor Thorkel's hilarious. It's just like yeah, Thor, not yeah, a Thor meathead, you know, sort of yeah. just like oh, you know, it's well, like <laughs> yeah. But you know, but and and like uh, somebody I was watching on YouTube. Um, I don't know if you're aware of him, uh, Shadowversity. Uh, but he was talking about. It, he's like you know. If you read, it's familiar, yeah, yeah, he's like, but he's like, you know, if you read the sagas, and he's like, exactly right. So, like, if you read the sagas, the sagas describe events like this happening. We're like, oh, he jumped yeah. over like 40 men to, you know, to do stuff like this. He's like, so what well, he's like, well, it's probably not accurate, it's accurate to the sagas that they're describing. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. another way you could put it, you know, yeah, um, no, I think that's really, really fascinating, and uh, yeah, and I think so. I think it depends on where we think. I think this is where I think it's important is what do we the one question I said before is what do we what do we want to change? And in what what do you know? And that's not a question I can answer. I'm just saying, no. you know, what, what yeah. do we want to change? No. And the other question is what are the things that are being represented that are actually harmful? 
yeah, either harmful exactly. to our understanding of the period or harmful because they feed into particular mm -hmm. sinister or nasty yeah, like, attitudes like today. The, you know. Yeah, like the um, toxic masculinity aspect, yeah. like yeah. with Rollo, who for one thing would have never was was like a hundred years after Ragnar yeah. would have even been a lot. But yeah, so yeah, and I I can't answer him either because I mean, while I have these criticisms, I mean my uh, my son, my oldest son, I I still let him watch How to Train Your Dragon, which of course the Vikings have the horn helmets and and I've never seen that. I must have. It's one of the few films I've never. That I it's, need to get into. There's about two or three of them now, isn't there? Two, there's two three films. Of them. There's three. three of them. Right. It's yeah. pretty. It, it, it's pretty good for you know a kid show. But like, so they have the horn helmets and you know the whole the whole idea that of, of Valhalla, which you know if you read the sagas, it actually didn't seem to be where they actually wanted to go. <laughs> uh, I do like. I do. I do. I have a whole other line I can wind you up about about horned helmets. But I, uh, uh, yeah. I actually have done a blog post defending horned helmets. Uh, oh, say, uh, as as a rhetorical stance, not as a actual literally. I believe they all had horned helmets, but as a no, no, and I know. could see. Well, I mean, and we do have evidence of horned helmets in earlier eras, like the yeah. uh, the Bronze Age horned helmets. And I do, I do think you know, I've heard the argue, you know, the arguments. Oh, you know, that gives a lever in battle. But, well, yes and no, because for me, it's like, well, if you look at um, like in Japan, a lot of the samurai. Hmm helmets they have horns there too and they did wear those in the battle so i think that that argument's a since point when is yeah. since when has when have warriors gear been about well, military expediency <laughs> i mean most did you say that grenadier guards from the 19th century yeah. british army could never yeah. have won a battle because they had bear skins on their heads you know you, yeah. you can make if you take these to yeah so I, my point is and because and, yeah. they, they would have been shot all the time because they wore red well, yes, they were, but, but they still wore it. You know? yeah. um, and, and so the point is, yeah, I mean, if you, you can't. I, so that's where I go with this blog post is I'm making the yeah. point that actually, you know, almost every event that could have happened archaeologically, historically within the early Middle Ages could have happened with a horned helmet on the heads of the people involved. And yeah. it would have made no difference yeah. to um to the, the key principal things we need to about. It's annoying. It's a stereotype. And we know that people yeah. almost unquestionably didn't wear them yeah, uh, um, but, but it doesn't mean but it's so pointless it's a dead end it's a cul-de-sac argument and the same thing about dreadlocks which is i managed to get myself embroiled in oh, is no. i don't know i don't know any conclusive evidence of vikings having dreadlocks but it matters so much to people yeah, <laughs> um, it doesn't um matter to me, uh, uh, you know yeah. But, 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 you know, it, it's like, well, you know, all of the events in the Viking Age could have happened with little beads in your beard or not. You know, it yeah. really I couldn't I, I'm actively, aggressively indifferent to how people, yeah. you know, shape their beards in the Viking Age. Apart from yeah. the fact we did have we do have lots of representations of people with beards um, from picture stones, from art and so on. But, you know, it's maybe some of them shaved. <sighs> yeah. Well, uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's that whole argument because, you know, I'm, you know, uh, uh, I am a uh, heathen. I'm not necessarily Norse pagan, but I'm I'm Germanic heathen. I'm more of a blend of um, Anglo-Saxon, uh, Frankish, and Norse. But you know, the oh. whole argument in heathenry is like, oh, you know, be you know, uh, is the whole like supposed requirement of beards, and we're all like, well, no, they they don't. And my whole argument is like, well, if you look at um the saga so the saga of the Young's Vikings, where Thor Kell the Tall first gets introduced. He's about to kill somebody, and it's in a in the person says specifically, no, okay, you, you know, you can kill me, just don't damage my hair. The whole oh it, yes, it has been on hair, and then if you look at Frankish uh, culture, the, it has a similar thing, and then yeah. also the idea of Loki shaving Sif's hair and the um, poetic. Uh, Prosata, uh, the Prosata. So to me, it's like the cultural significance seems to be towards hair, not beards. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and beards may have been important to some people because, like you said, we know for a fact that they grew them and they had beard combs. But, oh. but you know, and, and to me, really, it doesn't matter. If you want to grow a beard, I grow a beard. I don't care. But, you know, there's, you know, that's yeah. one of those things where, like, don't to, for me it's like i don't care if you grow a beard just don't say that it's required by our <laughs> it's not like in a there's a there's a, a laws of odin beard must yeah. be at least five yeah. inches regulation yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah 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 which is yeah, yeah exactly yeah, not getting into valhalla <laughs> yeah well and then and then you know and like you see in tv shows the the uh stereotypical valkyrie depictions yeah. which which i always argue well you probably wouldn't have wanted valkyrie to show up i mean Nyal saga described describes them pretty terrifyingly and yeah. then same with um volsunga saga is yeah. that there seem to be some things to be reined in by odin not 
beautiful maidens. They seem to be um, a friend of mine who actually has a master's in history uh, in Anglo-Saxon history uh, brought this up. He's like, they seem to be like described sort of like the Furies from Greek mythology. Obviously Absolutely. not quite one to one, but they seem to have similar functions as the Furies. So, yeah. Uh, you know, but uh, to me, that doesn't matter whether they're depicted that way in shows or not. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's no, no, yeah. No. So, no, so I, I think it's it's yeah. So it's, I suppose what we need as a community of researchers, academics, whatever you want to talk about, is yeah. at every production that comes out, not to just go to the default. They've got it wrong. They've shown a person with the wrong hair, or they've got a person with the wrong skin tone. How dare they? But because yeah. that feeds it, because that's where I think that's uh, we, we talked about this. You know, yeah. this is where uh, the very same fact checking can, it, you know, it, it can be mo can be mobilized yeah for to to ideas, to yeah. In, into into that into that and so i think it's it's about the problem we have i'm not saying I have an answer i say as a community we just need to not have to pronounce on everything the second it comes out and so i've mm -hmm. one of the um i better not talk about it here but there are some particularly important well-known political incidents that took place in your country that have happened in the last two years where people have immediate academics have immediately shot off their diagnosis based on um from a medieval perspective and i think they've got it wrong and they got it wrong in a way that is unforgivable in my view that actually could have caused even more problems oh, than it yeah, did yeah. so i won't i won't say anything further here but I've, I've got something coming out that reflects on that because my point is that we can't always pronounce on everything on any new tv show any and there was one that happened this year where certain uh already much largely dis um um, very big social media, big mouth in our period, who came out denouncing a new production on Viking on a Vi on the Viking theme, and got it so wrong he became a laughing stock and had to delete all the tweets because um, he was uh, it was a motive was in a good place, you know, but was clearly ill equipped to yeah. pass judgment on the issue. And my point is, we can all make mistakes. That's fine. Yeah. But the point is, this this has that has ramif pronouncing and getting it wrong has ramif or or having your ideas then used by people you didn't want it to be used by. Yeah. It, you can suddenly find yourself part of the problem. Is my point. You can yes, we can exactly. easily so yes. We don't like the way this TV show looks. We don't like the way this film looks. There's a problem here. Let me immediately produce an article for the conversation or for a, no, no, maybe not. Just maybe not all the time. Maybe sometimes we need to just you know, zip it. It doesn't need to be an immediate response YouTube video, because I think some of these things can actually breed a, a controversy that isn't there. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm not saying I'm I, I'm guilty of this, too. Yeah, sure. But I think uh, I think as a community, we need to decide what we talk about on these matters because i think sometimes we may have a heartfelt oh no we've got to counter this we've got to stop this because this is good and then we get it completely wrong and realize that it was actually heading somewhere very different particularly when we're even judging before the tv shows have even come out we're basically going on yeah. a poster a poster and a, a trailer i think really i mean i i mean i've seen some films where i've gone you know yeah that looks really good and we've all gone to the cinema and gone yeah oh my god i still can't get over the the the, the hollow feeling i remember coming out of the cinema was it 20 years ago in swansea having seen the matrix revolutions film and thinking <laughs> was that just a long trailer did i actually see the entire movie who am i where am i, I yeah I, 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 I don't even know what my name is anymore i it, it, was that <laughs> but you know my point is we all yeah. have that experience we shouldn't yeah. be judging based on the cover you know like book covers you know we shouldn't judge the cover and i've seen academics do that of late you know i'm um, having a go at um, popular books based on the cover literally i'm yeah. outraged by their cover and how they're representing whatever it may be and you think hang on come on guys you know let's let's just relax a little bit and take our time before we rush to judgment yeah, on I, on I issues agree, yeah. but 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 you know, sometimes we have to criticize and call things yeah, out. But... Exactly. Yeah. Because like I said, I, 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 you know, you know, I've seen uh, one, there's like one big YouTube uh, person who has made, and I've, you know, I've watched him, but now I've sort of started distancing myself because, you know, first I thought, oh, his, his stuff is cool, but then he started doing this stuff. Uh, and I'm not going to name him because it's not important, but, um, no, no, no. you know, but he's talked, he's talked about, you know, why, uh, why we shouldn't you know make historical characters and tv shows diverse and he's like you know, yeah i know who you mean <laughs> you know who i mean yes and I was he's a nice like, guy but i totally disagree with him on that particular yeah, point yeah, same here. i completely disagree <laughs> uh, i'm like you know it's like like i could care less if the um 
that wasn't now the Viking chiefess or whatever that's you know that's uh uh as you know black or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, I forget who that is, but yeah, there's that, and then you know, of course, now he, you know, connected though, though fictional, the, the Lord of the Rings show that uh, you know, Lord oh, no. of the Rings is based off of early medieval thing, and they're like, oh, there's black people playing oh, no. dwarves, and I'm like, I don't care, I'm like, no. let it, let, let it, them. It is, it is, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I wade, as you know, I don't know if you know, I did wade in on that one as well. I don't yes, know if you, you did, that. Yes. yeah, 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 okay. that. yeah, 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 um, because I, well, I saw all the big, your, I mean, I follow the Lord of the Rings TikTokers and I realized yeah. that they were all getting a really hard time, and I thought there was. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't claim to have done research on that particular topic, but I certainly know I can speak with authority on, on, on those issues. And while we can't, we can't know the exact numbers of people of what we would call people of colour are in Anglo-Saxon England. And there are some, again, some delusional narratives out there about that um, yes. that are taking it to ridiculous extremes. Yes. Um, well, I would say that the idea that there was ever a time in those, those centuries where people weren't present, I'm not talking about massive numbers, I'm just saying yeah. knowledge of and presence of, and that's why all I wanted to say. But the way people took it was, again, so ridiculous. I had so much hate for that, so yeah. much support as well, but so much hate coming yeah. from the angle of are you telling me that you know britain was all black or something like, no i'm no. not i'm like but then i don't want to get into those arguments because that's what they want they see everything in terms of color yeah and they they want to draw you into this this numbers game of this this ratios of of because they they're racializing the narrative and so i didn't yeah. want to do that so i just i just kept neutral and said no but we do have evidence that there were churchmen yeah. from North Africa, from Syria, you know, whatever color scheme you want to impose on them. And in our modern racist society, yeah. that is a fact. We know these people are from these regions. And whether we know, we call, yeah. Yeah. We know for a fact, like, well, for, for example, Marcus Aurelius uh, did uh, the only thing that that, that uh, the uh, 2004 Lord of the Rings movie got right is that we know Marcus Aurelius did bring 4,000 Sarmatian uh cavalry over to england after you know he made an alliance with oh you them. mean the king arthur movie from two yeah the king it, arthur movie with oh, yeah, yeah. Owens. that's the only yeah. thing it got right is because marcus yeah. realist did actually because i i like i fact checked that a few years back and it's like he did send them over there but we don't know how long they sit over there it just says he sent right. them over there and like was it for you know to send to the border to fight uh the the picks uh or you know was it for a permanent garrison we don't know but yeah, so there's that, you know, that too. And that's unfortunate, you know, to say to, you know, we still have to take into account, well, maybe they did stay there and intermarry. Of course, that was 200 years before Rome fell. So yeah, it does what take degree a is in there? Yeah. And that's, so that's one of those things. And I've shared, uh, I, in uh, Facebook, I shared a, a thing. It was a, um, by two professors, I forget who they were, but they they were talking about the diversity of of medieval Europe, and they're like, oh yeah, it was m much more diverse than we give it credit for. They weren't saying that it was like you know well, you know any degree percent this, but they're like we, no, no, no. we have to acknowledge. Well, like you know, Spain, the, the Iberian Peninsula had Moors in it for a good chunk of history. Uh, Italy was multicultural for much of its time. Yeah let alone the various Turkic steppe yeah. cult, uh, tribes that came in periodically and conquered Eastern Europe and parts of Central Europe. So, you know, and then I got attacked by that and I, any source, any paper I shared from an academic journal, they're like, oh, we're not going to listen to uh, the, the exact phrase. We're not going to listen to anything from Marxist indoctrination camps. I'm like, okay, well then our conversation. So they're done. attacking you, calling yeah. you a Marxist. Oh. Yeah. I was like, we're we're done here, and I turned off the comments. And so I was gonna block them, but I said, nope. I, I think here's here's how I, how I can hurt them. I turned off the comments on the post, so they couldn't comment, yeah. but they were still forced to see the narrative. You know, something that was contradicting their weird racist narrative. And yeah, so and unfortunately, that happens with academics all over the place, and you it's hard to combat because. Uh, unfortunately, while you're doing the opposite and having journals open, we have the a lot of these paywall journals where you have mm. to pay 50, you know, 50, for example, U.S. dollars or yeah. uh, however many pounds uh, or what have you, euros it is. And meanwhile, people like Joe Rogan or, or stuff like that or Graham he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Hancock, you know, yeah. are, are are easily accessible. 
What, what uh, I hadn't, uh, one of the things I, I must admit, TikTok's really actually better than Twitter for me. Uh, but one of the uh, things that I really find a challenge with it is that people are coming to my comments with really well rehearsed, copied. Oh, yeah. Plans of, it's not just simply a trolling comment. They've got a plan. And the mm. plan is to sort of how to attack me. And, yeah. I, and I, I, I don't even, I sometimes indulge it and see where, just to see where it goes. Yeah, sometimes. But they want to chastise me in detail for positions. It's all copied and pasted from some Reddit thread or from, yeah. from some, from some somewhere else. And I, I must admit, they do have the edge on me in that sense, because I, obviously, if you're just taking, cutting and pasting someone else's argument, uh, and it, you can see it doesn't even apply to what I said, because it's never about what I said. It's about, yeah. you are a liberal political activist i mean they haven't actually listened to it It could have been and they're clearly just copying it from somewhere yeah and and and, and in that sense it's just there's no conversation to be had the only point is when do i want other people to see that i can respond yeah and when and and that's the challenge isn't it is do i really need to waste my time rehearsing that i am able to stand up to these idiots because it's like you know i can argue at at a bus stop with someone if i wanted to i could argue in a in, in a queue at a supermarket with someone and I could show I I know more than them but is that really what I want to be doing on social media yeah, I mean exactly. so a lot, yeah. and then other times where people look like they're doing that and they're genuinely interested and a couple of comments on and you realize actually they were just generally not hadn't a clue and now I've explained to them they go oh yeah good I see what yeah. you mean and you go I wish I wasn't hadn't been so robust now <laughs> you know so it's it's difficult to gauge isn't it what what to mm-hmm. do but um but all I can say is you've got to be we keep going at what you're doing, haven't you? And uh, try to realise that there are people out there to deliberately trying to trip you up in some sort of silly little petty game of let's see if he says this is a response and that then I'll be able to have him on this. Uh, <laughs> and other people are generally just trying to find out stuff and engage and have fun. Um, and the, the problem yeah. is when it's all mixed together, it's very difficult. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've done that in public talks. I mean, I've done hundreds of public talks and you know, society talks. And I have sat in a in a room. I had one re- retired museum archaeologist as I was talking for a whole hour, just sitting. And they're going <laughs> and they ask you a question first question i don't understand convince me you're you know, you know and then you just smile and you do your thing and you just say well this is the evidence this is what i presented if, yeah. you, if do you have an alternative view no you don't you just don't want to you just don't want yeah. to yeah uh, yeah so that's it's true of everywhere <laughs> it's internet face to face yeah i i i seem to i remember a uh a lecture I was watching on YouTube uh, from an uh, archaeologist who specializes in Mediterranean archaeology, specifically Bronze Age, and he was telling an excerpt where he was in a meeting with one of his, with a, an older archaeologist who was like describing like uh, how how the Bron- the Bronze Age civilizations of the Mediterranean collapsed, and he had it in a very simplistic term that he's just like I uh, he's like I think that that's a little too simplistic. And they're like, oh well, you think you can do better? Uh, and he's like, yeah. And then he he's like, and then two years later, I had a book written <laughs> where, where I <laughs> so so that's sort of like that where it's sometimes where it's like you you can put the money your money where your mouth is. Um, and usually my strategy when I do when I share something academic like that and somebody um uh you know tries to comment and argue, I'll give them at most three comments. Uh, and you know, and then if they're not gonna con- you know if they're not gonna be you know conducive to the argument i'm like well we're i've shared my sources because i always share inside my sources you know i've I've cited my sources if you're not going to show yours we're done uh and then you know turn off the comments or something because the way i see it is it's not for them because they've already made up their mind it's for anyone else who may have been swayed by the crazy person's views who i can now turn away from (laughs) Uh, here's so, one for you. Here's one yeah. for you. I, I, I to to admit my, you know, I um two people tagged me and post t- TikToks about Viking onion soup, and oh. I went, ah, oh, this is harsh. I'm I'm sorry. And then I went, or is it? And then one of the I ch- I did comment on the two. I said I don't think this is some. It doesn't sound right. And yeah. one of the creators did say, oh, this is my source. It's from um, um, it's from Heims Kringler. Um, and I went, oh yeah, right. So I went and read the Forks and um, whatever translation. And yeah, I see where they're getting it from. And I thought it was just something that had been made up by a randomer oh. on the internet. But it is 
there is an issue here, but I'm going to do a TikTok about it because it's not what I think it's being portrayed as being. So, you know, it's not it's not complete myth, a myth. Um, yeah. But there is, there is, there is. It's, I don't think it is what people are saying it is, as you'd expect. Uh, yeah, course, but, but yeah. you know, my, um, my, my, I suppose my point is, I admit I was, a, I feel a bit guilty that I immediately dismissed it and thought, nah, Vikings yeah. eat drinking onion soup to see if they're injured in battle. And actually, there is a source that says that, but I think it, they've misunderstood it. And I think the, yeah. my response hopefully will point people into why it's actually more interesting than people are saying it is but i don't know if you've come across the onion soup thing no i have not uh good it's not just me then no it's like uh and you know and then uh you know there's um uh th there was that whole argument uh and this goes into the tv shows a little bit too you know uh the whole you know um uh, whether vikings were colonizers or not oh, uh, yeah 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 yeah. Uh, yeah which you know my, my my stance was you know when i did was like well they were but not in the in the sense of yeah, no, that's the point yeah that's yeah that's, that's the key point isn't it it doesn't matter yeah. what term you call it is it not in the sense of because that's all that yeah. the extremists want to say is what they want to say is that oh let's not worry about what the spanish or the french or the british did because everyone did it and i've had people in my comments saying yeah and i so i you know since the dawn of time people have colonized and i said what well, like homo erectus were colonizers you know it's such a if you want to treat any term by a dictionary definition that's so broad that it can apply to anything yeah. then it's it, people are only using it as a way out of co awkward conversation yeah. but you're absolutely right you you spot on and that's what i was trying to say but that everyone from every angle was yeah. trying to have a go at me suggesting you're yeah. just defending someone who's an indigenous creator i said because well, they're indigenous no, no i'm not and, i have no particular yeah. affinity with them i'm just saying they happen to be okay in what they said not because you know yeah yeah and, <laughs> and, and, I, and I made a video response to him uh but i was i was oh, very uh i was very respectful and, and told me you know this and I, and my exact words were essentially like you know and this isn't on you you know this is just a common misconception that people you know can only make yada 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 yeah. and then when i realized that people were coming after him in racist ways i was oh, like yeah, oh yeah. i may have screwed up and i did make an well, apology no. video you know no i did yeah. I mean, but this is the thing is i mean the ones i was reacting to because I'd, I'd spent a whole morning scrolling yeah. and seeing people go in that's kind of really petulant way well let me explain to you here's wikipedia and a map of the dane law and i go oh my god yes yeah. but you've kind of missed a bigger picture here guys you know yeah um so but i don't know of course it's true with anything is if you you know um well you you can't always know how things are going to be used and we're always open whatever we say in our publications can be manipulated by someone to yeah. feed a particular agenda and we can never escape that it's just a case of trying our best to uh navigate the crate like some of these things I, I would never in a million years dream that like there was a debate about some of these issues and that the other because i'm in my little world i know the the historiography of my yeah. area and then um then you suddenly realize that actually people don't know any of that do they so they're obviously gonna just jump in and think x is x or y is y yeah and uh they don't know why that is prompt a, a dodgy in narrative until you know yeah. what, what people are getting at <laughs> yeah so, exactly which is why you should always defer to i mean i don't pretend to pronounce on what's going on around the world in world history i have so many gaps in my knowledge i'm learning yeah. so much from so other creators and i wouldn't presume to know but um you know we can only do our bit can't we? <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and that's you know and and there were some people who were um defend who were uh defending uh the indigenous creator um uh who um, unfortunately is somewhat problematic uh, problematic now which we definitely won't get into in this video no. but um uh you know but the, the way they were defending him uh were were wrong too because one individual whom i had uh, run into and he blocked me after I shared sources that were contradicting his statement and he was making statements that, Oh, colonization only happens when a more powerful, you know, entity takes over a weaker entity. I'm like, but that's not always how that happens because for one thing that feeds into the narrative, like say indigenous Americans were weaker and less advanced than Europeans. When in fact the documents, I always cite, um, to Soto's documents where he's describing uh, the atlatls and the uh, longbows and describes how much more effective they were 
than the muskets and crossbows and how they could still pierce their armor, plus the intricacy of the cities and all this stuff. Yes. Uh, and the fact that they lost so many battles in the early stages. Like, uh, there's a, a whole thing in uh, Mexico called uh, La Noche Trista, where it was, or the Night of Tears, where essentially after Cortez ki killed Montezuma, the Aztec army was like, oh, okay, so all we, we decided to throw out all illusions here, and they started slaughtering the Spanish soldiers. They're like, yeah, we're in charge here, not you. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was my whole thing, was like, he's he's taking, you know, he's taking the idea of colonization, and like you said, you know, and not intentionally, but still imposing a racist uh, idea on there, that it's oh, only... Yeah a weaker thing i mean but that takes and doesn't take into account like the early stages of colonialism like um uh india colonized uh, britain colonized india well in the early stages of their colonization of india the mughal empire defeated them horribly in what was called the anglo mughal war and you see events like this all over the place and so to say that you know um because the uh, Norse and the Anglo-Saxons were on somewhat equal terms technologically, that it wasn't some form of colonization event, to, yeah. whatever, to whatever degree it was compared yeah, to yeah, European colonization in the 1500s and such, is disregarding how colonization actually happens. Absolutely. And I actually made, a, I actually made an hour-long video with my friend who's got the master's in history on oh, that really? subject where, we like, where I went through point by point. We're like, okay, yes, most definitely it's not the same as European colonization. And I stated that so many times in the video. I was like, but the things that the Norse did to the Picts, to uh, the Irish, to the Sami, etc., definitely fall in the definition of what a colonial power did to. Uh, okay, that's really interesting. I'll have to check that one out, Dane. That's yes. really cool. Yeah, think, yeah. And think, again, I'm not an expert. You are. Uh, but I, but you no, know, based on no, my history, based well, my knowledge of history, that's what I, you know. That's really, know. No, but that's really, and it's important we have, to, and that's again yeah. the point. It's not about whether a particular creator is right or wrong in the first place, but yeah. does this, can this become a constructive conversation? Yeah. Uh, and for most people, I think it has. There's, there will be the idiots who only want to score points on a, you know, particular point, you know, and, 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 but then actually, but this is where I think we move forward if we can actually yeah. find ground where we can have a conversation. And the thing is, I found, and I will say this again and again, because it, it is that I find that there's more intolerance within academia, um, as much intolerance, not more. Yeah. I mean, a much bigger population who are not in academia and a, and a much more extreme and vile people in different directions and different ways. Mm -hmm. And and it's not all on the same side. It is a you know you, I've had some incredible abusive comments uh, based on my my ethnicity and identity and 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 learning from people um, in response to that incident and others um, that I think very strongly are not not extreme right, but they are ex extreme in other regards. Yeah. And um, and I've experienced this over the last two years. And, and, and but I think academia has a problem of tolerance and a problem of polite discourse and not just polite discourse but of that actually reason discourse yeah. and so i've had a, i've had a situation where i can actually have really informed conversations with people who are politically completely different from myself not necessarily opposed but very different from myself outside of academia but within academia literally the kind of childish behaviors you would expect from a school playground suddenly come out and it's like um Ah, here's here's a here's a screenshot from him a year ago in a completely different context where he's contradicting himself. So there you go. And I go, well, that was on a completely different issue. And I was talking about X one, and you know, but no, it's all ah. And everyone's going, oh yeah, that proves it. It proves, yeah. you know. And you go, and you go, oh dearie me. And and it's it's and it's when you it's that whole point of bad faith. It's a more American term, but bad faith actor is when someone is yeah. is actively actively trying to score points rather than actually have a conversation. And I've seen so much of that within academia, and part of it is driven by people wanting to make a name for themselves. That's fine, um, but there's also part of it is driven by you know trying to be trying to be activist but not really knowing what an activist is and also trying to be an academic and not really understanding what an academic is i'm trying to mash them together in a way that can create a very toxic atmosphere so you know i i think that there's we all have to try and do our best with this this public facing yeah. discussion but i think academics really are um are, are some very childish individuals and it's very difficult to take them seriously both those that hide away and won't engage which i think is very childish in itself 
to be yeah. honest. Uh, and those that do engage, but will only do in a combative sense and will only do so to try and elevate themselves rather than try and talk about the issues. Yeah. And it's uh, um, and that can become quite, quite, really quite, de- you know, depressing when I, you can actually have better conversations with people outside academia. That That's a poor yeah. show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or with I, students or with, you know, people who are not yeah. in tenure job is, is what I, might, I mean, or, or, you know, in, 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 uh, in positions. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and uh, also, most definitely, unfortunately, as you mentioned in one of your videos, there still is some racism in uh, academia, yeah. like oh, yeah. with your video about the uh, Ph.D. student that you were uh, reviewing her dissertation. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, that was a that was a special insight. I wasn't sure about how I'd share that because I, you know, almost like I, I didn't rehearse it and I just recorded it. And I thought, is this going to make me sound like a complete idiot? Or, but it was it's difficult to know in the room. But it was one of those situations where there was nothing I could have done that wouldn't have inflamed the situation. Yeah, you know, there was nothing. The guy was leaving anyway, and he said what he said, and I and I was just left. And she handled it. You know, the the PhD candidate handled the the comment. Yeah. And yes, there were people on my comments going, oh, that's not racist. I mean, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it, it was. It, it, <laughs> you know. it most definitely is. Yeah. And, and <laughs> it was no way that I misinterpreted it. It was no. everyone. But equally, would there have been anything constructive? And cr- it would have only been cringeworthy and indulge myself if I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I want you to know I don't feel that way or something. It yeah. would have. I just went, yeah. right, let's move on. Let's you know, let's get on yeah. with the, 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 let's be professional, you know. And I think, but these incidents are not ex- unique. There, there are a number of them. And, no matter how much people say you can't always constantly call them out um but you've got to yeah. you've got to look out for the people that are being targeted with this stuff whether it's yeah. on grounds of gender or age or ethnicity or mm. and you've got to try your best to be sympathetic and uh you yeah know. most definitely because especially here here in well i can't say especially but here in the u.s too you know uh indigenous and people of color academics you know get attacked too uh um and like for example uh uh our mutual on tiktok um diamond dog uh 47 uh oh, yeah. talking about her her issue uh with in one of her videos she mentioned her issue with her when she was uh defending her master's thesis and you know it was white people trying to say well you don't know what you're necessarily talking about and of course i'm paraphrasing because she yeah. could describe it much better uh but you know that's essentially what it was is you know oh are you sure it's this or are you sure it's not this insert a white excuse you know no, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. so for stuff like that and i've seen that unfortunately happen and i've heard people describe uh black academics in in bad ways for one thing i live in the american in the american south uh which uh, <laughs> uh is still pretty bad and it's you know a place where they defend what we call the lost cause myth or, or the idea that the civil war is not fought over slavery it is uh and actually uh call a friend of mine uh who's a u.s history teacher and i have plans to deal with that uh at some point but uh yeah so it most definitely is and that's an issue um unfortunately all over the place uh right now uh and has been for a while and that's why we you know that's another thing you know we can use these tv shows to uh so okay this is how you don't (laughs) portray these things you know well i think that's the biggest challenge isn't it is and that's why i do i am critical of all these tv shows is the homogenizing the vikings as one ethnic group the sami as another homogenous ethnic group the saxons as all homogenous and then maybe if you're lucky you'll get some celtic speaking people thrown in for exoticism and on the edges oh here's someone with an irish accent you know um and and you know it's all very it's all very much um, uh uh you know playing off 19th and early 20th century models of yeah british imperialism and colonialism and I, I i will not deny that and that's the that's the key that's we're getting back to my question about what is the thing that matters and what is the most dangerous thing about these tv shows that's that's the that's the one thing yeah. <laughs> you know um and i will i will you know there's other things too but that, that, yeah but exactly. that, that's the one you know we yeah. should be focusing on that as a criticism rather than the particular shade of cloak or yeah. the particular brooch is yeah. 10 years yeah. off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, like, like the, uh, you know, like the, the, the Rus contact with the Turkic tribes uh, on the steppe, 
the only movie I've ever seen that even mentioned it, and it was only like a five minute mention, was the Thirteenth Warrior. We're like, oh no, the Tartars are coming. For one thing, <laughs> several centuries too early because the Tartars were the Mongol Empire, and yes, no, yes. It, it, as we saw, the the Russian state stood absolutely no chance against yes. the Mongols. And really, if they had actually continued, probably none of Europe. Um, some people disagree, but the the uh, experts on uh, the Mongol Empire generally like no, the chances are. Europe would have fallen, whether not n not necessarily very quickly, but you know, still. But they st it still showed those steppe tribes, you know, at least for seconds. So I would like a show of Vikings to like, oh, we're gonna go meet the Khazar uh, Khan, or you know, the the Khan of the Bulgar Khanate, you know, yeah, something like yeah. that. That would have been cool. That would be cool, you know, something that isn't just oh, we're going to England or we're going to France, and where yeah. we're somehow. Uh, we're somehow like the, the early Viking show. We're somehow winning against the still unified uh, Carolingian Empire, which they would not have done. Charlemagne would have would have kicked their teeth in. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know. But yeah, so I would I would love to see that. Um, definitely. Uh, and and I think there's a way. You know, that this discussion could eventually lead to that, where we could eventually like, hey, you know, let's bring them in. Bring you know, because it would be you know cool you know to have a that weird shield turtle thing they have in the vikings oh let's do it defending against you know arrows from uh turkic you know armies of turkic horsemen you know now you're talking that'd be yeah. very cool yeah so yeah um all right and uh so you know it's a uh, we're getting on uh two hours here uh but okay yes no yeah. no which is fine uh what i was gonna say is uh so on to my friend's question actually let me uh look at his exact question so i don't mischaracterize it uh here uh, do, do, do. uh no. okay here we go um <clears throat> here uh, has the increased interest in norse history from things like uh the viking show altered the nature of your work uh in any way that's interesting okay so as, as a kind of wrap up reflection question that's a really good one and i think my answer would be i think the very fact i'm actually publishing papers about these shows mm -hmm. um is one thing only it's one thing i have i have published now three articles academic articles about the tv show vikings and one about the last kingdom and i want to do at least one um, i've got one coming out that's a broader a field I've, I've proposed the invention of a new field of research which i'm happy to launch in this context and tell you about for the first time but it's coming out as a paper I'm, i said we should have a whole field of dedicated research called public viking research okay that actually is interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary and involves media studies history archaeology philology you know um the whole range of different disciplines but also um that actually take seriously as fields of investigation pop culture man representations and i while there is a broader medievalism field which is much more centered on later medieval tropes yeah. and stereotypes uh, medievalism is 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 not the same thing the vikings in particular have a, such a distinctive set of nest of popular conceptions in the 20th and 21st century that um, they demand their own field of research. And I think that hasn't been, there's a number of books that have come out recently, including the Digging Into the Dark Ages book that I co-edited with my student, Pauline Clark, mm -hmm. that do the, set the foundations for that. There's also the Tom Burkett and uh, Roderick Dale book on Vikings Reimagined, which does this too, and mm -hmm. some other books. But we are, we've are we got the groundwork now, and I think the next stage is to create this 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 field of research called public Viking research that's about understanding and critiquing not validating, but critiquing and evaluating this, how how our Vikings work from museums and heritage sites through to TV shows, manga, anime. Okay. So that's my first point. Mm -hmm. And my second answer is um, the actual TV shows actually do, I do learn from them. I learn to the whole range of things I never thought about that the TV shows have had to make decisions on of how to represent. Um, I've I've learned, you know, you learn from them, whether they get it right or wrong. I learn from those those representations. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I've learned from the fact that they're so rubbish in their representation of Anglo-Saxon helmets. You know, yeah. that is in, that is interesting to me. I mean, so I've I've been forced to think about things I've never bothered to think about by mm -hmm. watching the TV show. So on a practical level, and I and that leads me into the point that I use it to teach with. So I've I, I think it's changed what I research, and I've I'm advocating a new field of research that sort of mm -hmm. links together medievalism and medieval history and archaeology, and I'm also advocating that this is these tv shows are teachable they are use they're usable in the classroom to reflect off so yeah it has changed what i do in my job um right. but honestly i can't start playing video games or i'll never sleep so i i, I can't do it all <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. but but, yeah. but uh, you know yeah i'm right there with you i used to play video games a lot when i was younger and i've now i've been like i've working on so many different you know research things that, you know and i have kids so yes, of course. which you know take up quite a lot of time absolutely uh absolutely so, so yeah so yeah that's well and that's that's very interesting i think that's a good idea i mean like you know on the italian helmets like well you know they we know that they traded with the italian peninsula with you know the byzantine empire and uh the muslim kingdoms and such so while that one would have existed say like what could have existed that could be in the same regional idea or yeah. uh the the ridiculous you know scale armor that they're wearing that wouldn't be how scale armor is put together like okay well they didn't wear that but that is an eastern type of armor what you know so what based off of that region could they have worn based on their trade with so, I mean, we have the, the um, was it, the Osaberg Buddha, you know, that shows that they traded as, you know, indirectly, but still traded as far east as Central Asia. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a very good idea. And so, yeah. I, yeah, I just I just hope that, that and, and I, I, if, as a final point, I think obviously you're going on in academia, but I think this video may have a broader audience and. Yeah, just to say that I don't see academics. This isn't just for academics. We need, you talked yeah. about stakeholders before, whether it's Norse pagans, whether it's heathens more broadly, mm -hmm. whether it's reenactors, whether it's local yeah. communities, this kind of conversation is not just for academics, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 And that's uh, that's how um, that's how I do it. And, and uh, my friend who's got the master's degree, he's heathen also. And that's how we, we try to do it. We we you know unfortunately heathenry has this reputation the self-imposed reputation that it's got the religion of homework and recently uh, we've been trying to um uh, along with other friends we've been trying to be like well that if, all religions are religions of homework so you're making it prohibitively unnecessarily prohibitive you know for people to get in so that's uh, one of those things we're like well why don't we you know we don't have to make them do their research we have the knowledge that's why youtube channels and such like why don't we have the information out there in much more digestible ways to do that so that's mm -hmm. definitely that's definitely in that realm you know you don't have to uh you don't have to have a degree to talk about history as long as you do it correctly uh so i think that's the what that's definitely the one of the la one of the things we need to talk about um and it's glad and i'm glad why why we talk about it in this video so it's yeah. like it's right there you can talk about this as well if you don't have a history degree um, or archaeology i mean i'm Absolutely. you know you have your already you have your phd in 20 some odd years of archaeological experience and i'm gonna go into my master's and phd as well but uh you know those are our passions you, you know you don't have to be you know you know pa passionate enough to go into archaeology or history you can just you can be an armchair historian as long as you're getting it right so exactly and we're all learning all the time i don't yeah. have all the answers like yes, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know about onion soup and now i'm going to do a TikTok yeah. about it just because i'm inspired to do it yeah. <laughs> liking onion soup you know who would have thought that in i would have been doing that in 2022 but you know <laughs> yeah exactly well because i don't know is an acceptable thing to do in science uh like archaeology or other science fields uh, so you know that's another thing we need to normalize like we can say we don't know you don't yeah. have to feel um whether it be emasculated or feel um yeah. embarrassed that you don't know 
I say I don't know all the time because unfortunately being an archaeologist, people ask me questions that sometimes are outside of my field. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I, I you know, don't know. <laughs> no, no, exactly. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm almost every TikTok I do, I'm responding at least once in that fashion to some very pertinent question. I just go, I'm not the person for that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to, or we'll, we'll just become the self-appointed renter mouths that we have yeah. some on all channels all, all different media where they have to answer from the nearest wikipedia source and pronounce <laughs> on, on on everything and it's exhausting and it's pointless and it they may get a big following for a time but they're just making themselves look ridiculous in the longer term i feel and uh, i think yeah. we've just got to resist that urge to become self-appointed experts on everything yeah, to become to become a, a graham hancock or eric uh, or um is his name eric, yeah or eric von donakin uh yeah yeah, yeah. uh who are unfortunately refused to disappear. Uh, yes. Or, or uh, another, Scott Walters with his with his fake Roman sword that he found. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's exhausting. It, it's demoralizing yeah. so many times with so much misinformation out there and disinformation, actively constructed fakery. Yeah. And that's, it's yeah. not just misinformation, it's deliberately. And yeah. that is, it is in, if you're exhausting, but, you know, we can, but we can but do our bit <laughs> yeah exactly and you know and you most definitely are i've enjoyed your tiktoks for uh, ever since i've been uh following them uh thank you so much yes thank, thank you. you yeah you're, you're very knowledgeable of course way not more knowledgeable than i am in, in the oh. subject but you know <laughs> but still you know and then i'm still doing my part with my yes. Uh, still technically undergraduate, uh, even though I've graduated, but, uh, you know, my undergraduate knowledge and continuously expanding. I mean, I, <laughs> so I research videos two, three weeks in advance and I'm working on research papers and I'm trying to get a couple of papers published, but I need to edit them better. Uh, Ooh. but yes, uh, Sounds one, is, one, one actually I presented a couple of years ago at the university of Reading. Uh, so, uh, Ooh. via, via zoom, it was, um, uh, it's uh, one I call uh, the Norse Renaissance because uh, I sort of took the idea of the Carolingian and Macedonian Renaissances, and I was like, all right, let's look at how the how the 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 Viking Age expansion changed uh, Europe. Uh, I, oh. I I got a criticism that I felt wasn't really uh, merited, where because I included um, I include included the Normans uh, and such uh, the Norman kingdoms, and I was like, well. Yes, they aren't technically Viking, but to the the fact that they were descended from them, you know, and to not bring them up ignores the, yeah. the you know that effect that they had, regardless of whether or not they were still purely Scandinavian or Viking anymore. So, uh, which is another one of those criticisms that occasionally comes up, but I've since addressed it. But yeah, so you know, I'm doing my part too. Uh, Good, but, and you have every yeah. right to. You know, have as yeah. much of a view on these things as I yeah, do, and exactly. I'm looking forward to his see, hearing more about your ongoing yeah. work. It sounds exciting. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. good well, luck with all your endeavors. And maybe when I'm in the UK, I can come to one of your lectures at some point. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it'd be nice to meet up if uh, hopefully after this COVID, there's more of a travel is a bit easier again, and yeah. uh, hopefully things are opening up. So, yeah, that'd be yeah. lovely. So, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> definitely and i will definitely continue to watch your videos so <laughs> and, and likewise it's good to be connected and uh, oh, most you know, so so uh, yeah um thank you very much for inviting me on <laughs> oh you're very welcome you're, you're thank you for coming on it's you know you're the one who uh <laughs> who's the guest so thank you very much for coming on to, to my channel and uh talking about your work uh and such uh you know and and uh, you know we of course both went off by, uh, several times on tangents my my dad my dad has a tendency to be like well when he got a bit tangential and I, and I always have to tell him who he's going to be one of the pe first people to watch this video sorry dad welcome to academia the <laughs> amount of lectures i've sat in where people go off on tangents <laughs> he's, he's, you're doing the right thing if you want to be an academic i'll tell you yeah, exa exactly <laughs> go off on tangents about any kind of subject because people I'll, I'll ask questions and it'll go off on a 20 minute tangent <laughs> without fail, regardless of who I sit in a lecture with. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, all right. Well, uh, again, thank you for coming on um, and uh, have a good, uh, I believe it's about to be 8 p.m. there. Uh, yeah, nine. Yeah, it's coming up to nine, nine now. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, nine. Oh, well, my, I was off by a little bit, but yeah, have a good yeah. 9 p.m. there. 
Uh, and you know, like I said, and, and maybe we'll, you know, maybe we can do this again with a with different subjects. So yeah, fantastic. That'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be fun indeed. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Well, you have a good night, and uh, you know, and don't forget to send me the link. Uh, of the, course, yeah. I, I will. I will do that immediately, actually, because I've got your email, and I'll upload it now while I before I forget. As soon as it you know allows yeah. me to download, and I'll yeah, oh, I didn't yes, think yeah. of that before, but I'll do that. I'll do that tonight, and so you have it heading your way for whenever you want to download it. I think it gives you know. Is is All that right. okay? Yeah, that's not fine. Yep. All right. Well, uh, take, take care, mate. Take care. Yeah. Thank you again. Cheers. Oh, bye. Thank you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>